The following podcast was recorded Saturday, December 12th. Thank you for listening. Welcome to episode 15. I don't know. A New Horizon. A New Horizon? Yeah, isn't that what the one episode is? No. Let's see. That was the way. The, the, <laughs> there's the Phantom Menace. Attack of the Clones. The Fan of Menace. Uh... Revenge of the Sith, New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, A Tinge of the Sith, uh, what? A New Grope, what? Oh, what are the new ones? The Force Awakens, Skywalker Awaking, S- something and something, Death of the Jedi's, <laughs> Death of the Jedi's. You know, I love Star Wars. Best documentary ever. Best documentary ever. But. Uh, I find myself sitting there thinking and wondering from time to time. I'm like, you know, maybe the Jedi were the bad guys. <laughs> maybe, maybe. You mean a secret the system, council that the system controls of, things from the behind system of behind government doors? that they had before the Empire rose to power? You mean the Republic? We're, we're the bad guys. Yeah. Because look at, uh, you know, you look at the story. And I guess the original trilogy trilogy doesn't really dive too deep into it. But, uh, you know, the Republic is kind of oppressive. They've they've established, uh, you know, trade regulations and they're trying to... The Jedi are trying to force people to to follow their line of thinking and do their their thing, right? Stay in line. Yeah. And what does the Empire do? Invades. Invades, kills people. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Puts down but, dissenters. But they they hire, you know, independent contractors in the way of bounty hunters. <laughs> they allow the bounty hunters to be on uh, imperial ships with their personal weapons. They don't outlaw anybody from owning owning um, blasters and anything, and you know. How bad could they really be? Yeah, they blew up a planet, but I mean... They needed to get that? Sometimes examples must be made. (laughs) I mean, shit, we firebombed Germany. Towards the end of the war, they were sending the 8th Air Force and fleets and freaking fleets of B-17s and B-24s to just carpet bomb Berlin. They said that they're they admitted that there wasn't any military target. They were just trying to bomb the people into submission. Um, But the crews themselves would look for targets of opportunities. They'd look for military targets so that they weren't just bombing civilians. We also candy bombed them. After the war. (laughs) I'm just saying. I don't think that the that the rebels in the New Republic were really telling us the entire story about the Empire. You know, I'm not for communism or socialism or any of that. But I'd still like to hear Stalin's side of the story. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Some people will be so scandalized by that. Scandalize the right word? Sure. I love it. I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. Words. Indignant. Ind- <laughs> Clutching their pearls. Impotent. Impotent. That's a, whenever you don't know, impotent is the correct word. <laughs> Just goes to show the importance of words. Vocabulary. You know... If you have to, you're going to not like this, Mitch. I don't like anything. If you have to, um, if if you have to use crude language to express yourself, then you don't have a good enough vocabulary. Well, what if you have, actually have a good vocabulary, but you just don't. Well, then you don't have to use it. Then you can just choose to use it. Then you can just choose to use it, which is completely different. I have a pretty expansive vocabulary, I just don't use it. (laughs) (laughs) 
actually has little rascals. Okay. So every, every once in a while when we start talking about things and um, I'll be saying, you know, be talking about whatever and I'll start using my my vocabulary. I didn't know like, you could read. <laughs> yeah, people are like, what? Are you sure that's not, the right word? I'm not. And then they pull out their I'm phone and they look so up the word. It's like, how'd you know that word? They're like, I'm not surprised that you know that word, but I'm surprised that you're using it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes I get words mixed up because I've had a lot of concussions. I'm retarded. You've been concussed? Concussed. That's the official way to say that. Concussed. You just cussed. Your face just cussed. Do you know how many funny things there are with words that like, like look Hell and at drums. money. Look at oh. all of the terms of money reference water or electricity. Let's go to the bank, bank of a river. Let's charge our account. Really? Let's, like, there's so many different funny things that like, words are funny. And they, they speak a truth that is, is not always obvious. I've never noticed that. Thanks, Fred. New conspiracy. <laughs> Maybe not all the words, but there's a there's an awful lot. All the words. Even awful. I had my daughter one time ask me, like, Daddy, why do we say awful? Like, uh, no, what did I say? I said, that's awful cute, or something like that, or that's awful nice. She's like, why would you say awful nice? It took me a minute. And like there's mm. awful is like full of awe, but there's also like awful is like terrible. And I, I had never been forced to think about that distinction. And it caught me off guard. Kids Because are I'm an adult, that's why. Because <laughs> I said so. Whenever you don't know what to tell your kids, it's because I said so. And then don't ever follow, bu follow up. It's terrible advice. That's great advice. Although it is. Teach your children about tyranny by being a tyrant. Yeah. We'll teach them about the the pains of tyranny. The f the funnest thing that I do with my kids, not funnest, but the thing that I like. I don't know if the most might not be the best, but one thing I do most with my bestest. kids, most bestest, wonderful thing that I do with my kids is when they have conflict between the two of them, or th any of them, if all of them are fighting or whatever. It's the question is like, do you want me to solve the problem? And they all know that if I solve the problem, everybody loses. Like, I make sure everybody's unhappy. And it's like, <laughs> do you want me to solve the problem? <laughs> like, you should be in government. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing is like, if, if you want me to solve the problem, I'll solve it. But nobody's going to be happy with my solution. And sometimes they'll try and, and they'll try and make it so that I solve the problem because they think they know how I'm going to solve it. And those times specifically, I just make it terrible for what, like... I, I, you know, it's 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 so interesting because it's like if you if you're if you have a problem that you can't solve together, like that happens, and you can come to me, and I don't want them to feel bad for coming to me, but I want them to know that if the problem is superfluous, trivial, I, trivial, yeah, I will make sure that nobody enjoys the solution that I find. Yeah, except for me. <laughs> you weren't even there. But I was. <laughs> you ever heard the song "Every Move You Make"? The stalker song. Yeah. Yeah. I like to listen to that late at night while I'm sitting in your driveway. I can't sneak up on anybody in my truck. <laughs> but with the missing muffler and <laughs> oh, that's great. And everything, it's not quiet. It's not a stealth truck. <laughs> <laughs> So, do we officially live in the Upside Down right now? What? Like, the craziness. Where did the Upside Down, where did that term come from? Topsy-turvy. Have you seen, there's a show, uh, Strange Things, Stranger Things, Strange, something like that. They call it the Upside Down. But it just makes so much sense where it's like, everything's not the way it should be. Not the, not the way that it should be. Uh, I don't know how this damn thing works. Aha!
talk. Me? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that happened this week, so um, Texas filed a lawsuit against um, three different states. Well, if I can remember them off the top of my head, I'll be impressed. It was Wisconsin, Georgia, uh, Philadelphia. There are 22 states. It's Philadelphia. What is it called? Pennsylvania? I don't remember. Yes. But um, so Texas filed it and then many states joined in and many states joined in towards the other side. So it's kind of a... What? What is this? Just wait. Oh, it's playing the wrong song, damn it. This is, this is, um, 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 Topsy Turvy from, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah. Nice. You're saying outside that world. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but what I was going to point out is oh, that's the, how you the Supreme Court, they, um, I think they originally took up the case and then they decided not to take it up or they, then they decided not to hear it. And so... The Supreme Court was originally formed as one of their main roles. One of their original roles was to um, help uh, the conflict between states. And it's interesting how, like, in the last 10 years, we've had the Supreme Court coming out um, for gay marriage. We've had it coming out for and, and changing a lot of things in our society and making the, being the, the focal point of the decision on a lot of things in our society. But the thing that they were originally designed to do one of the things they originally designed to do is adjudicate between states, the conflicts between states, and they they put that aside and they're like, oh, we, we're not going to take this up and stuff. And it's not a, it's not surprising by any means if people are paying attention. It's like, yeah, the Supreme Court doesn't want to have that hot be in that form of uh, that that place, and so it's, it doesn't surprise me that they that they um, chose the coward's way out. But it's also like. Our, our institutions, the one of the things that makes our country work is the people's belief that the institutions are working. And the reason that Texas took up the filed lawsuit is because the different states didn't obey their own laws in um, in counting and tabulating and all that stuff, the, the federal election, the presidential election. The, the Texas's case was, you guys are not keeping your own laws like you have the right to to run your run your elections the way you want but you're not even keeping your own laws and that's affecting what who's going to be our president that affect that affects everybody exactly and the supreme court they they don't want to hear it and so it's like it's the 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 public rightfully so no longer trusts many of our institutions because our institutions have proven themselves to be untrustworthy. And and it's like that's that's part of the breakdown of our country. And you can't you can't um, claim that it's that it's conspiracy or that it's um, not right. It's simply like there's 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 so much different uh, evidence that that thanks to the 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 internet and the flow of communication that that has been provided there is so much direct evidence from individuals who are per, who are personally involved and you wouldn't get that in years past and it's like well the when you no longer can trust the institutions of the of the country there I mean, and and that goes for a lot of things like other things um the ATF they've started they raided a what was it P80 yeah, polymer eighty, and they um, and they basically are saying you were you were they're changing the definitions and the the rules that have always stood. Cause so that's one organization. You look at um, the CDC, and they're they're basically they came out with a lot of these statistics, and then they came out a few months later saying that ninety nine percent of their statistics were inaccurate um, in in regards to the coronavirus. And this is a few months ago, um, and they've come back like it's it's waffling and everything's changing. You um, you even look on local levels, and you look at like even here in Utah, if you go to the um, what is it government 
the thing that shows it's it's not gov it's a federal website there's a, there's a federal website where you can go to it and look at where a lot of the cro uh, coronavirus aid has gone to and um, for for instance Florida had I think 22 million uh, 22 billion um, New York had 28 billion Texas had like 30 billion and California had like thir like 41 billion or something like that Utah had 105 billion um, is is the highest by more than double allegedly um, what allegedly allegedly I mean that's I, that's I, on there. I've actually wanted to look into this I did I went to the site you and, went to the CDC yeah I went to not the CDC this is the Utah dot um, okay that one site and I went to it and at first they didn't find it and I had to you had to you had to flip the filters so it showed where the um, it showed where the the account or where the funding was going and Utah had a had 105 or 105 or 108 billion that was it was receiving but then you go to Utah and like where it's spending that billion you can't that 100 over 100 billion you can't find it and then you look and I looked through the I, I went to Utah's site there where they print out their um their uh, that one because you sent me that video long a while back um did you send it to me the one that was talking about the, the states getting the different money. yeah 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 you sent it to me, and I and, and I, I said I wanted to look into it. I watched and then it. I never did. Yeah, I watched it, and then <laughs> I, 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 I sat on it for for two weeks or so, and then I was like, I want to I want to know if that's actually true, and I started looking into it to see, and I was like, because it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right. It seems so. It seems so. There's so many big gaps in. Well, if there's a hundred billion, hundred and five, hundred and eight billion or whatever going to Utah, but Utah only has a total state budget of like two billion, and or something like that and it's just like i, I could be i could be remembering that wrong but I, I i it was like two weeks later and i i had a hard time finding it on the federal one until i put on the correct filter where it was like this is where the money is going and then it showed up clearly and then when i went to the utah state budget i pr it, they come in a pdf and i and i browsed through the pdf i read through the pdf i didn't i didn't detail fine comb it um because a lot of it was stuff that i didn't understand um, as far as like uh, uh, county stuff and you know it's just stuff that wasn't what I was looking for but the it, I, I got to a table that was like the o overall state budget and if I remember right it was like two or four billion or something like that for for all Utah expenditures and it's like well what happened to that other 108 billion that was just from coronavirus support it's like it's it's so it, there's so many things that you if you continue to trust the institutions of power it's like you know, fool me once, shame on me. Shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. It's like, you know, you think Said about that backwards, huh? Said that backwards. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Mm -hmm. what, whatever it goes, I don't. I don't remember. But you think of like a leprechaun. You think of like a leprechaun who goes and like tricks people. You know, and the, just folklore. And they're like, oh, they're they're waiting for someone to catch them because like they'll trick you until you catch them. And we're being the people who just don't even think about it. And we're like, oh yeah, trick me. You know, what do you mean? Of course we're going to believe you. Of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, that's the exact way that we become slaves. Like, that's what happens. We become slaves. And it's just, it's, it's, it's what's happening to our country. Yeah. Utah, our, our state government anyway, I think is becoming a new heart of corruption on this side of the country the utah is always praised for its its forward thinking in business but and you fiscal look at conservatism which has been gone and missing for a decade now yep you can't sit there and tout about having a surplus when in fact you're just raising taxes every year and you're collecting too much it's and not you, a surplus it's an over collection you also think of like how um Again, I, I mentioned it last time, I think, but Mike Lee and his his bill that he passed, making it easier for for foreign workers to come in. And it's like, wait, we're closing small business at the same time we're making it easier for foreign workers to come in. It's like there, nobody who has two brain cells to rub together. <laughs> Sorry, is that? But then again, I kind of like speaking the truth and then people getting upset. I'm not apologizing. So. <laughs> but. 
No, I. There's something going on with our, with our state legislature. I don't know what it is. What's going on? Something is off, and something is wrong. There was there was a book that was written 20 years ago, and I just heard about it this week, and I haven't read it, but I've heard really good things about it. It was written by a J.R. Token. No, that was no. Stop. <laughs> it was written by a. Um, the Chinese stra- uh, military stri- strategist. Oh. But one of the things... Stephen that, King. No! Sh- oh, I want to I take that poker and hit you with it. <laughs> but um, no. he, he basically said... So it happened um, in the early 2000s where... Um, where... What's his name? Bush. He, there, was a, there was a report of something that happened and there was came coming out that it influenced the military decision that that Bush made in in handling it. and this is back in Iraq or something like that so a news report came out and there's only a single news report and Bush um, authorized some kind of attack or something like this and I, I don't remember the exact instance of this but the the guy in the in the in the book wrote it and he basically his his whole thing that he came up with in this 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 philosophy around warfare was that more of the more and more warfare is fought in the public eye in the public sphere if you can get people to believe stuff and that's propaganda has always been a thing but if you look at like Sun Tzu which is he, he wrote the art of war he's a, a military uh, he's a Chinese strategist but he's a, supposedly one of Confucius's um, pupils potentially there's I mean there's there's the, the history's muddy but um he he's one of his one of his sayings and he has tons of sayings but one of them has something to do with it with if you can the, the best the best war is never um is never fought and it's basically if you can convince someone else not to fight you and to, to give in that's how you win a war the, the easiest like that's the best way to win a war and like that's china has china china is um it's contacting our members of congress and our and our politicians and our judges at a rate supposedly at a rate 12 times greater than Russia and like 18 times greater than than um, what was the other country that was on this study uh, I want to say it was you uh, it might have been Ukraine it might have been Germany I don't know but basically foreign foreign influence like trying on a local level and then the whole concept is you get local politicians you get um, influencers with these local politicians and then as they grow into more prominent politicians then you have power and influence with them and you look at like Feinstein her um Diane Feinstein her driver that she had for for over a day all of these there's like several different cases that have if if you look for them there's been um at least in the last month or so there's been like three or four prominent uh, mil- uh not military US um members of Congress who have who have had relations with spies that have been d- discovered uh, Eric Swalwell was one of them best known for shitting himself on national TV um, <laughs> there was a couple of governors and mayors mm-hmm. they've been sleeping with Chinese spies a lot of uh, there was one guy in California I remember that was brought up so I mean but that's okay let's vote for Joe Biden let's have Joe Biden be the president and, and here's the thing, while this is going on, everybody's focused on masks, everybody's focused on stuff that doesn't matter. You look at the, how long Trump, uh, what do you call it, term in office, it was three years of energy and money and human f- attention was, was paid to that whether they're hunger, whether they're like just problems that we have in our country. You mean like real problems? Like real problems. Oh. We could have been solving real problems, but instead we're everybody's so focused on Russiagate, 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 and now you ask the right or the left, nobody nobody cares. Nobody cares about it because it doesn't matter. It, it was all just a, a, a theater, political theater. Means to an end. A means to distract the American people. Yeah. I think the problem is is we're we're at war but nobody seems to recognize and understand that. Or they don't care. 
windy. Man, That's that wind is blowing from the north. <laughs> I'm glad we moved the, the chairs. Yeah. We're in the same spot. Just rotated. Just rotated. Because the wind. Yeah. Maybe next week we'll rotate the other way. It's kind of like magical chairs. But maybe not. I mean, there's no telling what could happen. But, um, back on, back on subject. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's... I have no doubt that Russia is influencing our politics and influencing our policy, but it's not the way that we think it is. So everybody, just for the last three years, it's been Donald, Donald Trump is in bed with the Russians. Um, but when you look at it, why the hell would the Russians want Donald Trump as president? They still have sanctions on, on Russia and more sanctions from Trump. but. gave them a third of our uranium sold it to them uh, the Bidens with Russia the left is notorious for doing something and then saying look what they're doing they're doing what we're doing it's projection. when they're not doing what they're what they're doing uh, and it's always projection and in in politics that's the thing that gets politics so muddied up is that you have people that are good people doing the best they can and you have other people who are not who are bad actors and they project their evils on these good people and it's like you never as as a regular citizen you never know who to trust because they won't tell you nobody yeah everybody says trust me everybody and it's like the the fact of the matter is you don't trust any of them you and you shouldn't you have a a tri I'm blue. I'm a I'm a donkey or I'm a blo um, elephant. You're stupid. You know. A llama? I'm a llama. I'm, I was thinking like a uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Are you from Bolivia now? <laughs> Whatever. A llama. But there there's so much oh, um, there's so much interference in our politics, and it's aided by our by us consuming the media. Like the media is so against us as a as our our country, th there's there's no good actors in the media, and that's that's what that's what basically um, the the one of the things that this Chinese guy the um, that wrote this book he he pointed out is like that's how you win the war that before you have to fight it is you get you you d make the people believe that it's it's hopeless. And it's like no, the the secret combinations of our day. So many of them, not so many of them. I don't know. It, it'd be it'd be hubris on my part to say I know the secret combinations. But here's something that I that I strongly believe and I strongly suspect, and I to the point where I would I would I would nearly I, I would I would bet a lot on it. <laughs> I was gonna say I'd nearly bet my life, but I don't care about it enough to bet my life. But it's um the media. It's a part of the, the conspiracy. I'd bet my life on it. I don't care too much about my life. But, you know what I'm saying. Uh, the thing that, so it was either yesterday morning, I think it was yesterday morning, I woke up, the first thing I thought in my mind when I woke up is, the way that the Nephites destroyed the, the Gadianton robbers and the conspiracy, the, the, the secret combinations, before Christ came, was they gathered to their cities and they starved out the secret combination. They let them basically die. We need to starve the media. You need to stop consuming it, stop watching it, don't give it your attention or your time, because that's what gives it power. And that's the, on the only way to starve the media is to turn it off. That, that for me, personally, my, my desire for freedom and my desire for, um, for the perpetuation of our country and, and the perpetuation of, of liberty is is one part of this podcast another part is to give people another option of stuff that they can consume without having to to engage in the media because the media is not have any of our best interest in mind what where are you going getting wood gotcha <laughs> grow up mitch never I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon. 
No, I was wondering why we weren't getting any coals to the bottom. It's because none of them were separating. So look at that. Man, I'm awesome. Think that? You're the only one. Somebody needs to, and I've got it too. <laughs> um, well, so not only what a great piece of wood put that back where did you get this my house i love it do you want to keep it no good put it back in the fire i kind of do but not right now i've got a pile of wood at my house you can come look at it this is like so this is like old lumber because you look at it it's not yeah it's been sitting outside for years yeah but even the cut of it it's not your you don't it's not a two by ten, it's not a two by eight. It's I mean it's the old two by fours. Or two by it's probably an old two by six or whatever. Because the, the two by fours that the two by eights and stuff, they got now they've they've, they've trimmed them down and trimmed them down over the years. Mm -hmm. Over the last hundred years, the, the size of lumber's changed so much and it's like, man, that's a beautiful piece of wood. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> You're a terrible person. <laughs> that I am. <laughs> Here's to me. <laughs> oh, um, back to back to the secret combinations. I don't think. Well, I know it's not just the media, but I think it's also both political parties. Yeah. Both of the main parties, and I mean, look look at the Utah GOP. Look how dirty and corrupt and out of line it is it they are republicans but they don't do anything to even resemble what the republican party is supposed to stand for but i mean i'm barely a republican so <laughs> if here's here's no, my opinion here's here's my thought if you're listening to this podcast and you've been republican all your life and you have a straight strong loyalty to the republican party it's similar to name a brand who has had great quality and has then produced crap. Colt. What? Colt. Colt. It's similar to. Most I, I would wager that a lot of people who listen. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking. I was trying to think of a different one that so, is more. So for years, um, Colt Manufacturing has provided a significant number of the United States. Um, if we look at the 1911 pistol, that was a John Browning design that he sold the patent to Colt. And that's what John Browning did with most of his with most of his patents and, and guns. He sold them to other manufacturers, Colt, Winchester, so on and so on. Um, and so for years, Colt built the 1911s for, for the U.S. military. They were, I mean, not all of them. They were other contractors. If they Especially during the wartime, but um, their commercial stuff also. Well, they've also built all the M6. Not all. They built a significant majority of the M16s and M4s for the United States military for decades. I mean, Colt's always been a huge supplier of arms to the government, and they've had their name out there in the in the civilian market for decades. I mean, they built fabulous, fabulous guns. That's why you get the old uh, the old adage in the 1911 world: if it's not a Colt, it's a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Um, but I mean, they used to be just second to none. I mean, their craftsmanship, their workmanship, everything was just superb. Mm -hmm. What happened? I don't know. When they they got comfortable with their name being enough, and I mean. I've had a lot of 1911s, uh -huh. um, and every, all the 1911s that I have now are all Springfields. I've had Sigs, Colts, Kimbers. Kimbers were garbage. That was another one that was really good that are now garbage. But uh, the Colt that I had, the finish on it was good. I mean, it looked like a good gun, and I didn't really have any major issues with it, mm -hmm. but it didn't run 
like what I expected it to. And it didn't run like the old uh, War Era 1911s that I'd shot before. I mean, those old ones from the 40s, man, they're beautiful. They work great. And anyway, Colt's just kind of gone to garbage. Smith & Wesson's another one. Used to be really good, and they, they've gone to garbage too. They get comfortable with their names. They start cutting corners and production suffers and you know they know people are still gonna buy it because of the name recognition because of the name and that's that's what's happened in politics is typically you have and and you'll see this with like companies when they change management when they change um, when they try to reoptimize their their um, profits and stuff like that they cut once they have a, a strong name brand they cut quality so they can have a larger margin on the on the on your what they're making and it and it inflates them in the short run massively well we've been doing that in the republican party for the last three decades at least at least and in your whole life the republican that you are has nothing no bearance on the 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 organization that is there right now and it's like you your values are not reflected by that party and it's just I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news but that's the way it is I'm not sorry wake up pay attention to what they're doing I mean neither side tries to hide what they're up to and when they get caught it's just like yeah we got caught and that's it and they just keep doing it and we just sit back like well I guess I guess this is the way things are and none of us are willing to do anything to actually affect meaningful restoration to our founding core principles and part of that time that as long as we keep people comfortable they're not gonna do anything you're even taught in school why did Rome fall because of bread and entertainment. I thought it was because the Visigoths came sweeping down and burned the shit out of everything. Do you know why the Visigoths came in? Uh, refugees. They were refugees. They were refugees and then within, what, 30 years of them being given admittance, they they sacked Rome. But, yeah. why? Because they lost their core values. Yeah, because it was an empire and they they lost their the things that made them who they were they lost their identity and that's what i mean you look at you look at the the united states right now and then you ask you ask take five different people from different extremities of the united states and you ask them what does it mean to be american and you will be lucky to get the same answer out of two of them when it should be what it, it should be you know, freedom, um, just and equal representation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. What does it mean to be an American? It means to be free. And it means having an obligation to help promote that liberty. And you know, I there's something that I that I've that I've heard uh, a million times growing up in the church and. And, um, you know, with being proud to be an American and our heritage and our founding and our, our founding documents, um, it has, I, I wish I had the scriptural reference. I believe it's in DNC, but, uh, it's talking about the Constitution that it is, will spread forth to the rest of the world. That it's not just, for America, it had to have America to, to become, but it, it's, it's meant to spread to the rest of the people of the world. Is that in DNC, where I'm referencing? Yeah, it's in DNC, but I don't remember where either. 134, 98, 101, somewhere in there. I would guess 101, but I don't know. But I mean, that's that's how important it is. And that's what, that's what it should be to be an American being free and not just being free but 
doing something with that freedom to promote the freedom and welfare of others the right way and what's the right way to do that well not probably not by force not by sending in our military to places to we will make you free yeah we're gonna free the shit out of you <laughs> um, that's probably not the way but if the people if the people of other of other nations want that and they decide they want to rise up and adopt this system of government I do believe that we should aid them I don't believe that we should fight wars for other people but I believe when it comes down to fighting for freedom if somebody if, if the help. people have made that step I think we should be obligated in a way to help them whether it's providing arms munition and in training I don't know I don't know what specifically what the right way is to do it but I agree with that sentiment I agree with that desire the thing that I disagree with is I don't trust our government to tell us the correct thing like oh no and they're, not, know, they're not gonna support what I just said exactly that's, that's exactly the, the people the people in the government are not righteous enough to do that and so at this point we, I feel like we need to take an, uh, no, um, a stance on just making ourselves good again. Yeah. Because I don't think that we have, um, I don't think we have the moral standing to, to do that because we have allowed such corruption into our government. Yeah. But I do agree with that. Like it's it's our job to reach and help people stand. But and the so, time's not right yet. Yeah, and, and we're we are not we are not we're on a crisis ourselves. We're we're losing our our faith in our con, on our um, institutions. People, c- kids in college, they don't they think that the Constitution is outdated. Like they're being actively taught to believe that the Constitution is suppressive and it's uh, racist and it's and it's something that is not meant for our time. That's what that's what multiple different um, college paradigms are teaching that's what multiple different um people that even even people in churches and stuff like that the russia you were mentioning russia's influence russia if you look at the different um the different things that russia was was has actively like been trying to influence they've been trying to infiltrate churches education government but government's been more of the less of the priority because it's if you can if you, you have can, to change the people you have to you change, change the culture them. you have to yeah and you look at like my my kids this week they're they were going doing music stuff and my wife asked my, my wife asked my one daughter like well why aren't you guys doing any christmas songs why aren't you doing any christmas songs my daughter's like i don't know and she asked her teacher the teacher's like well not everybody's christian and we don't want to make people feel bad and I, I kind of am familiar with that argument because I grew up with that argument. It's been an argument that's been propagandized to us for lo- forever. My wife was pissed. She's like, what the hell does that mean? You know? And is Well, like, even when we were in school, it wasn't uncommon for it to be like that in other, in other states. But yeah. I but remember you, in, in choir in high school, I remember we sang... Uh, we sang a hymn. We sang Christmas songs. There was a big battle politically, right? I think our freshman year to make sure that the the schools could still sing Christmas songs, and and it, it was a big deal. And well, I remember there was a girl in our senior year in choir who was like, "I want to sing this. This is a separation of church and state." And our choir teacher says, "Nobody's preaching to you. Nobody's." Nobody's trying to make you believe something. We're singing a song. Either sing it or don't. <laughs> love that. Love that, man. Dude, I loved his hair. <laughs> oh, that's and I know he likes our Facebook page. I don't know if he actually listens. Yeah, I, I don't think many people on the Facebook page listen. But Brian, your hair was amazing. It has inspired me, though I have <laughs> none myself. <laughs> but he'd go into his little tirades and he'd be flip around his hair would be going everywhere yeah and it would come down and it would flip over his face and then it would just 
<laughs> right back. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. <laughs> oh, that's great. You're an inspiration to me, Brian. <laughs> and that's the thing is like we I mean think of that argument though well think of how powerful music is oh that's it it is and I'm going to say something that you'll I don't know I'm just going to say it you, you look at the music that we've had over the last hundred years all of the new Christmas songs that we've had literally over the last hundred years how many of them don't reference Christ or or something to that effect. And if you look at those songs, a vast majority of those were written by people who are not Christian. And it's like it's it's there's songs that you like you think of like jingle bells and songs that are like you love growing up. There's so much it, it's it started it's it the, the whole subversion of our American Christian culture has been going on for over since since the beginning since the beginning of our of our country over over 150 200 years and it's just like there you you do with what you can you try and remove christ you try and remove um any reference to divinity you try and remove anything like that and it's just like wow that's that's been a long time coming and it, the reason is, is because that's the way Satan works. He knows. He understands. He knows that parable, that song, that these things, these um, the folklore, these things are the, the stories that get passed on to generations, and they affect the whole paradigm of generations. And, and we're right now at a point where there's been so much attack against Christianity that you have legitimately people that are preaching Christianity, and they're... they're, they're preaching homosexuality and sodomy they're preaching abortion they're preaching um the virtues of of enslavement of of children and it, and it's just like there's there's so many different things that are that are if you if you think about it and if you take the time to think it's not it, it's not that way and it doesn't need to be that way it's just that you know what my favorite christmas song is silent night no, I do really like Silent Night, though. Angels We Have Heard on High. I love that song. It's beautiful. Yeah. I think Silent Night's my favorite. Silent Night is another beautiful song. I mean, some of the most beautiful songs that I can think of that I love and cherish the most are Christmas songs. The good, the beautiful, and the true. But... I mean, we, we look at the Christmas story. I love Christmas, which is surprising to many people because I'm kind of a grouch. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love I love Christmas time. I love the colors. I love the snow when we get snow. <laughs> um, I just, I love Christmas. I love every everything about it. I love Santa Claus. I love, I love colored lights. <laughs> I always have. But... I love the music. Maybe not Paul McCartney. I think he's a piece of shit. I hate him and his music's annoying. But, I mean, tr the traditional I'm not Christmas argue songs. With that. I like the Christmas songs before the 80s. <laughs> when we started having, like, Santa Baby. We got a horse singing to Santa Claus. <laughs> Um, That's literally what that, that song is. Yeah, it's a horse singing to Santa Claus. But, like, the older, the classic, um, the classic Christmas music, I love. Oh, Holy Night, you know, the, the songs by... Little Town of Bethlehem. Yeah, the songs by Bing Crosby and, uh, oh, who's the other guy? Andy, Andy Williams. I mean, I, I love I love that stuff, but a lot of the newer Christmas music is just junk. There are a few exceptions. Even songs but, like um, "Silver Bells" don't have references to Christ. Yeah. Like even some of the old classic Christmas songs that you love, they don't reference Christ. And it's one of those things that I've been noticing more and more over the years is you have Christmas songs that celebrate 
the season and they celebrate the presence and they celebrate the, the, the shiny lights and they celebrate the feelings, but they actually don't come close to Christ. And they're not, to me, I find them of no value. Yeah. Well, and like going back to Angels We Have Heard on High, that song, you know, the music itself is, is, is beautiful. But you read the words and then you look at another version of that song, Angels from the Realms of Glory. And it's just, it, the, the music's beautiful, but also the, the lyrics, the words is just beautiful. And you think of it in that context of, you know, Christ is now here. And it's joyous, it's, it's celebration. And... You know, it's just, it's hope. Which is one thing that we are lacking, severely lacking in not just American society, but, you know, the world in general. But I, I love Christmas. You know, I love, I love that it's the, the season of Christ's coming and everything. But really, I just love everything about the season. Yeah, and it all stems from it, you know, from Christ. It makes me wonder when Christ returns if we're going to have, you know, the the concourses of angels singing the same tight, the same way as they did when he when he came first time. That's what it, angels we have heard on high is about. The angels singing and the shepherds hearing and, you know, just, I don't know. It's just an amazing song. A lot of those Christmas songs are. Yeah. That's the thing is like... Merry Christmas in like two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. It's such a good time of year. It is. And it's such a good time in the world. Like there's so many there's so many amazing things that are happening. But yet we're we're so focused and again, I blame a lot of this on the media, but we're so focused on the negative and the bad things. I blame a lot on the media, but I also blame a lot on the government and the different churches and including everybody that I don't know. We talked about this earlier. Yeah frustrations that we have but I don't know neither here nor there here's the thing the prophet told us to learn to follow the spirit and that's really it's very important it's very important because when when you have a direct a direct connection with God when you have a way to listen to what God wants you to do, it doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks. You do exactly what God wants you to do, and you're okay. You're doing exactly what He wants you to do. And it's, it's, it's dangerous because we can be deceived and we can be tricked and stuff like that. And so, so it is a hard, it's hard question to know, okay, do I understand what God wants me to do? That's not always a clear question, and it's not always an easy thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why this life is so hard, is because if, it, if we knew exactly what God wanted us to do, it wouldn't be hard to just do it. But we don't. And some things, some things are like, they're, they're intended to be difficult because this life is not a cheap experience. The life after this life is not going to be a cheap experience. And it's like, well, anything of quality takes effort to produce or to create and it's like learning to follow the spirit it takes quality effort and I, and I love that that's what the prophet has has preached in the last couple years now if you see it seems like it's it hot, hot. <laughs> it's only hot where the the liquids coming out oh that's the weird. steam over here it's not yeah that's not hot right there too bad I need a smaller piece. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Aha. Excellent. One of the things that is very important that I think happens far too often in our church is we are not meant to have false idols. The hero, hero worship that we have for whether they're bishops or stake presidents or members of the Twelve or even the Prophet, these, these men are, are servants of God and we, we need to treat them as such, but that does not mean that they are God. And that does not mean that we, um, we abdicate our agency to them. Our agency is ours, and it's sacred, and we have to choose how we use it. And the war in heaven was fought over that agency. The reason that we have the ability to receive inspiration, the reason that why we have the Holy Ghost, is so that we can keep our agency and not just do what someone tells you. And so we can learn for ourselves and edify, be edified from God directly. And it's important to, to not put the love of man regardless of who that man is, over our love of God. And that's something that I think in the church it's too easy for people to be like, well, if the prophet says this, or if the apostle says this, that's good for me and stuff. And I, I, I love that, that desire to do what's right, but it's also, I, don't, I think it's insufficient to, to abdicate your agency. It's important to take the steps to pray and ask God what he wants you to do. And that's just, it's, it's something that, it's a, it's a hard balance because some people, some people are, I mean, we're all at different stages and we're all at different, we all have different spiritual gifts. And some people, it might be the right choice to just do it, what the prophet says. But as for me and, and my belief, I believe that I want to follow God wherever he is. Whatever he wants me to do, I want to do it. And that usually is is done through prophets and and, I, and so I, I sustain and I trust the prophets but it's also like I can't I can't just take that's that's an easy out you can't just take an easy out on that you have to also receive that confirmation from God not everybody is meant to do the same things um, I mean to a certain extent we are we have the commandments and those are rules that we're all supposed to to follow and uphold and our, our our principles and everything but I mean everything is not just cut and paste for everybody yeah and it really depends on you know who you are and the Lord's plan for you specifically some people are meant to be hellraisers. Mm. Some people are meant. I mean, look at Porter Rockwell. I was just thinking exactly. Look at Porter Rockwell. He was oh, such he, a great man. He is often over overlooked in church history. He he had a, a business running a, a ferry. I mean, in the, in the early days of the church, and when Joseph Smith needed money for for papers and for and for publishing and everything like this what did Porter Rockwell do he did sold it all and donated not 10% but all of it to publishing the Book of Mormon and not just publishing he also provided money for um, paper for Joseph Smith to you know be able to translate onto um and I mean, it's just, Porter Rockwell was not the pitcher of the early church that we all often seem to think of. <laughs> People don't know, I didn't know this, I learned this recently when I was studying about Porter Rockwell, but he, um, there was a point where, um, where Emma was, was away. I think she was with her family for a month or something like that. And Porter had just come into town, and Porter was looking to find some work and stuff. And Joseph told him he could. He well, could... Porter had just been in jail for eight months. Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. He'd been in jail for eight months. <laughs> and well, um, Joseph let him let him start a let him uh, operate a saloon there in the mansion house, like he had a bar. <laughs> And Emma came home, and Porter had a white shirt and the you know the bow tie, and he was cleaning glasses and stuff. And Emma's basically like, "He leaves, 
or I do. <laughs> and, and so Porter set up his 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 little bar just across the street. Across the street. <laughs> yeah. And it was like Joseph. He loved Porter Rockwell, and he loved his soul. And it's like a lot of people would be like scandalized by that. And and it's like you know, we don't understand. We don't understand Porter Rockwell. We don't understand the context. Yeah, of, he he killed a lot of people. He loved the drink. Um, and you know we we've all heard the story about Porter Rockwell, where Joseph told him. If you don't cut your hair, then no bullet or blade shall ever harm you. That part of the story is legend. It's it's what, actually yeah. What Joseph Smith had said to him is, if you are faithful to your covenants, no bullet or blade will ever harm you. And there's a there's a oh a story um, of one of the times that Porter Rockwell was involved in a gunfight I, there was somebody if I remember the story right somebody had just robbed a bank and they were hiding in some dude's house and this dude goes over to Porter and says hey this guy's in my house come get him you know and so when they when they end up fighting each other the guy pulls both pistols and shoots 12 rounds at Porter Rockwell and the guy who is recounting the story says that he witnessed a bullet go through Porter and out his back like saw it come out the straight back of his coat and it didn't hurt him it just passed through him so and, and the important part to remember is yes porter was a very rough individual but he had to be for for the church and for it to succeed and for the members to be safe and everything we had to have Porter Rockwell. Porter Rockwell had to be the man that he was. One of the things that, like, you know that whole story where if you don't, you don't cut your hair, the way that the way the legend or the way that it's interpreted, for, supposedly, Porter Rockwell, he, he decided not to cut his hair in memory of his covenants. Yeah. And what did Porter Rockwell do towards the end of his life? He actually, the widow of... Um, Carlos. Don Carlos. She, he he met her and she was a widow and he ended up. Um, I don't. Did he marry her? I think. No. He, oh, did he not? No. She was, but she was bald. She had lost her hair. She and, was really, really sick. Yeah, and he felt bad for her, and he he cut his hair and he made he went and he took his hair in and he made a wig, and gave it to her. Just, his hair was who he was. Yeah, and it was it. That's that's the thing that people don't understand about Porter Rockwell is he was the type of person who he give you he, he, he I mean remembering his covenants and remembering you know obviously it's something that he cherished he, he dropped it in a heartbeat to help this woman that he he respected and loved and wanted to because she was a part of the Smith family yeah that's how much Porter loved Joseph and loved the Smiths and it's like and he was far from perfect. On he another, spent a lot of his time drunk because of you know where he'd been, what he'd been through, what he'd seen. I mean, Porter had a rough life, and he was equally as rough. He liked to drink, and at this time, you know the the um, word of wisdom had been around for a while, and I mean his. He was kind of a tormented soul. <laughs> I mean, living that type of life and killing people has that effect on people. And and the way that we view a lot of things in the church, like we view, a lot of people view um, alcohol and tobacco use as like, you're going straight to hell. Like it's one of the worst things that a person can do. And yeah, it's not good and we shouldn't do it, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. Here's the thing is like, we, yeah, go ahead. We, we naturally want to value things that are like do's and don'ts and ways, litmus tests so we can, we can check against each other instead of evaluate how we treat each other. Instead of evaluate how we're, how we act towards our fellow man. Because when you evaluate how you treat that person who you disagree with, 
it's a much harder evaluation. It's much harder for you because it's like, are you treating people right? Are you treating people the way Christ would treat them? That's, that takes a, a devotion of soul that is, it gets into you and it, and, and it, and it requires you to change the core person of who you are. That's that process of repentance, that process of changing the natural man and putting it off and really just loving God and loving his children. The, the, the mere fact that other people are God's children is enough to make us treat them with respect in a way that is not, that, that is not easily dismissible. And yeah, the way that people choose to, to choose, choose their agency makes you want to also clop them over the head. Right. But not because, not because you hate them. Not because you want the worst for them, but because they're they're not living up to their potential. It's like constant battle of, of expecting more from ourselves and from others, and also loving who we are as as individuals. And it's an important thing to find a balance in. Yeah. But yeah, this is a long roundabout way of saying that everybody's not not meant to be the same the lord doesn't have the same plan for everybody and you know just the most perfect example i could think of was was porter rockwell that's a great example um but you want to know my absolute favorite porter rockwell story yes and this comes straight from this comes straight from the uh history of the church it's in Brig- brigham young's diary or lorenzo snows i don't I don't remember exactly, but I I remember <laughs> enough of it perfectly and accurately enough. I'm still listening. The, I'm the, sorry. The story the story goes: um, Porter Rockwell was drunk, and he was bare ass naked, save it, his boots and and his gun belt. He was riding around the temple lot on a unicycle. Firing both guns into the air every time he'd he'd take a lap, and uh, Lorenzo Snow would giggle, and Brigham Young's in the middle watching all this go on, and and he he remarks to uh, I think Joseph Fielding Smith as Porter's doing this drunk naked. Porter uh, Brigham Young says to Joseph Fielding Smith, "What a goddamn idiot." Wait, who's Brigham Young? Brigham Young. That's a word-for-word word quote. <laughs> I'll I'll find it and show. I'll share it with you. <laughs> Freaking awesome. <laughs> Why does oh. that sound like <laughs> like Brigham Young? No, like we could. Well, that sounds like uh, it's almost close to home. <laughs> Except for you. You don't know how to ride a unicycle, and I don't drink. <laughs> That's oh, such a funny story. Oh, that is my favorite Porter Rockwell story, just because it's so funny. <laughs> but That's I mean, great. what, what a faithful man, a true and humble servant. And I think a lot of a lot of his problems that he had later after the church moved after the church moved to out west um, I think one of the things that he struggled with the most was the fact that he had to stay behind when Jesus, when Joseph left Joseph, Joseph had to commanded. command him yeah and Porter Rockwell that's he when when he received a command from the prophet he did it mm-hmm. and like that's that's one of the things that like Brigham Young after Joseph was was um martyred Brigham Young he asked Porter Rockwell to go in and turn himself in and Porter Rockwell did he turned himself in for, he figured he was going to be hung he, yeah and he knew it like he, he was like okay if that's what the Lord needs of me I'll do it and with and he went and he turned himself in and because he did that it gave the the mob was concentrated on this trial that was going to happen in like a week's time and it gave the saints a time to where they 12, could 12,000 saints they could get out without being molested by the mob and 
12,000 people were able to get out of Nauvoo because of one man. And then at the trial. He was dedicated to doing the right thing. At the trial, he was found not guilty. Self-defense. Yep. He had, he had killed one of the main leaders of the mob. Uh, two, he had killed two people, I believe. But one of the main leaders of the mob that was likely one of the people who was rushing the, the who alleged, stairs and killed yeah. Joseph Smith. And it, it was in self-defense. But, I mean... I, I, you know, I understand Porter's loyalty and love for Joseph because I'm a very, I'm a very loyal person and for somebody that I cared about and loved so much, like, like Porter did for Joseph to be commanded and have to stay back while the person that he loved so much and cherished so much was going to his death and told Porter as much that would be a terrible awful trial and I suspect that he suffered with that the rest of his life yeah that destroy you inside Mm -hmm. and so yeah and and he he did it he chose to do it because he followed the prophet he had followed Joseph he had his vices he was far from perfect but I mean I imagine that that I imagine that that reunion when he got to the other side was so beautiful. And you know, he he woke up the morning that he died. He woke up, walked over, put his boots on, laid back down in bed and died. The Lord let him die with his boots on. Yeah. I don't think we would have the church to the extent that we have it, had it not been for Porter Rockwell. He was a huge part, but we don't we don't focus on him because of the long hair and the drinking, and the gambling, <laughs> and the shooting people. But I mean, he was instrumental to the church. Yeah, in multiple ways. An amazing man. In a lot of ways, probably another Captain Moroni. Yeah. So I'm sure Captain Moroni had his vices as well. He was a warrior. He see, saw and did terrible things. But, I mean, the warrior... The warrior is just a different person than your normal society. And I think different things are expected from them I'm keeping an eye on it to make sure it doesn't fall so I don't know none of us are perfect it's so easy to dismiss the things you don't understand Mm -hmm. but I I honestly think that some of us are made to I don't know. Walk the trail differently, maybe, is a better way is a better way to say it. Like Captain Moroni, like Porter Rockwell. Some people are just meant for other things. And that's you have to have that type of person. One of the things that um that comes to mind is when I said that sometimes things are, uh, it's easy to dismiss the things we don't understand it's really true that, like I was thinking of this is something I've been thinking of just this last six months or so when I was on my mission uh, I went to Romania there was so many people in Romania who are orthodox that it's it's like what, 90 99 percent of the people in Romania are Orthodox and they so they view it as like a cultural thing a lot of people don't necessarily have strong ties to like the I mean they're Christian and they they 
they cross themselves when they drive by a church and they um, they give money to the priests and stuff and they, they participate in the ways that they understand or um, and and it's easy to, to belittle that faith or it's easy to not give credit to that faith but one of the things that um, that I came to realize just the, over the last little bit is one of the things I would say to people when they'd be like I'd, I'd knock on their door and I'd talk to them and I'd be like hey I'm from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and we come in and share a message about Christ and I'd be like what church like well, I'm, I'm Orthodox and I'd be like it's okay I'm, I'm American and I thought it was kind of funny you know a, fu- a funny little like most people were like oh okay you know and it, it, it was a way that felt like non-confrontationally addressing the fact that I'm not Orthodox but I this this as I was thinking about it the, over the summer, I became a little ashamed of that attitude because it's like you don't you don't know what those people have been through. As I've as I've studied more and as I've learned more about the 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 Romanian culture and the the history, when they went through communism, Ceausescu he burned. I think is in the order of like 300 churches. These are like cathedrals, not not like not like oh you're a, a little church. These are cathedrals that had been hundreds of years old. Oh, that's a great idea. And the the priests, the Orthodox priests in Romania, because they wouldn't deny their faith, they were tortured, and they were they were um, executed, and and they were just. The, the, these people have been through a lot and for me to just kind of w- hand wave the oh I'm not orthodox and, and not really address it in a way that's that's appropriate it felt so disingenuous and it made me realize that it was it was it's just it's just uh, it's so easy to, to discredit the things that other people have and they, and they value simply because we don't understand them um, one of the things that even as a missionary, I would get really frustrated with, is, so in Romania, they have a thing called um, Corent, is what they call it. It's a belief in, like, tricky wind, is what it got described as. But the idea that, you know, wind, they, they didn't have a constant, they, most people didn't believe in, like, allergies. Instead, they believed in, like, Corent, where you, the wind would go into your ears and it would cause infections in your ears. And there was branches of science that, I mean, doctors had been doing science on it and stuff, and it's like, they're there there were missionaries who would who would talk about it and they'd be like you have to be a stupid human to believe something like this and that attitude i just it, even as a missionary as a as a 19 year old it, it rubbed me wrong i was like you're here to serve these people you need to love them but just because you don't understand something or just because someone acts differently or has a different belief it's so easy to discredit them and that's so dangerous it's so dangerous because it it's just it, it how can you treat someone with true and, and true charity and true love if you don't give them the the chance to to to, to listen to them to to understand them you don't know what they're going through you don't know the the history of what they've been through you don't know anything about them but yet because of their color or their language or their race or you, it, you you write them off and you think you understand them. That's one of the reasons why I get so frustrated with um, a bunch of these different um, psychological classifications. You got like the Myra Briggs and uh, even your big five personality types. And like a lot of these personality types are focused on putting people in boxes so that we know how to treat people that we're not familiar with. And there's value in it because I mean there are trends that happen and they, they, they there are things that that people um, show across multiple uh, a, a big diversity of people they, there are types that that come up over and over again but when you start putting people in boxes you start thinking you know and you understand them and you stop getting trying to get to know them and you stop trying to get to understand them you stop you stop listening to them and that separates you from the love that you should have for them and that's something that I think is really it's it's happening in our day and age well, far too often yeah I agree with everything you said I listen to most of it <laughs> part of it I couldn't hear you're cutting wood which we have more wood here do we have enough I think so how long have we been doing this one um, I think we've been going for 
like almost two hours now. Already? Hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so about three hours. Seems like an eternity to me. What? Did you want to ra read the um, Article 2, Section 1? Yeah. We read this together earlier. I read it while I was pouting. <laughs> you were what? While I was pouting. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd want to go over first or instead? No. We talked about Porter Rockwell. And I love Porter Rockwell. Hmm. Man, the wind is blowing. I'm, I just hope that chintzy little flagpole I put together doesn't break. Oh, it will. It's wet down pretty good. I hope. Yeah. I don't really... I, is it bad that I care less about the Gadsden than the Betsy Ross? Seems normal. Yeah. The Gadsden's a battle flag. <laughs> what? You know, the Gadsden is an anti-government flag, and it's a, for extremists. We talked about this last well, week, didn't we? Color me extreme. It's like, I'm glad you're learning history. They're trying to turn it into an anti-government symbol. <laughs> it's always been an anti-government symbol, you <laughs> jackass. <laughs> ah, it's snooty tooty peoples. People are dumb. Yeah. And the thing is, we're dumb too. That's what sucks about it. <laughs> okay. Article 2. Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and together with the Vice President, <coughs> chosen from chosen for the, for the same term, be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. But no senator or representative or person holding any office or trust or, of, or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with them, with themselves. And they shall make a list of all the persons voted for and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of governor of government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate the president of the Senate shall in the presence of the Senate the president of the Senate shall in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives open all the certificate the certificates and the votes shall then be counted the person shall the person having the greatest number of votes shall be the president. If such number be a majority of the of the whole number of electors appointed, and if okay, and if there be more than one who have who have such majority and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president and if no person have a majority then from the five highest on the list the said house shall in like manner choose the president but in choosing the president the votes shall be taken by states the representative the representation from each state having one vote a quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the states and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice in to a choice in every case after the choice of the president 
the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. You know, I wish they still had the person who got the second most be the vice president. They would force, like, that's one of the things that's enabled, to, to me it seems like that's one of the things that's enabled the, the two-party structure, is like having uh, an executive where you have w only one party. Because before it was like, well, one side would be voted president, and the other side would be voted vice president, and they had to work together. Yeah. You know, and it's like, that, that seems so much better. I agree. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's some logical reason why they're like why we're sold on why it's not that way anymore but it's like mm, I don't know if I believe that power yeah I, I don't know if I believe that okay um, choice of the president the person but if there should be if there should remain two or more who have equal votes the Senate shall choose from them by ballot the vice president the congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall be given shall give their votes which day shall be the same throughout the united states no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the united states at the time of the adoption of the constitution shall be eligible to the office of president thanks obama Douchebag. <laughs> uh, neither shall um, neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. In case of the removal of the president of from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of his, of the said office, the same shall devolve on the same shall devolve on the vice president and the congress may be may by law provide for the for the case 2930 for the case of removal death resignation or inability both of the president and vice president declaring what office what officer shall then act as president and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or the president shall be elected. The president shall at, at stated times receive for his service for his services a compensation which shall neither I gotta back up. Why? Because the it got hot. Did you did you hotten it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you hotten it? <laughs> you made it hotted. <laughs> which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other em emolument from the United States or from or any of them. Before he enter on the exec execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. This is the only oath that we find in here. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The power of an oath. What power do you think that people have? People give it these days. The oath, or Just an oath. An oath. None. It does not need to be that way. An oath is a big deal. Yeah. The whole "my word is my bond." A lot of people scoff at that. Fools mock, but they shall what? Rejoice. Mourn. Mourn. You got that wrong. Idiot! <laughs> uh. No. So, 
Do you want to talk about the uh, great and abominable church? And our thoughts on that? Hmm. I don't have anything specifically. Did I say I wanted to talk about that? I know no. I sent you some things that I want to talk about, and I don't remember what I sent you. But my you thoughts... You wanted to talk about sodomy. Oh, shit. Sodomy? <laughs> I think we should make it socially uh, un socially <laughs> unacceptable again. <laughs> Call out the sodomy. I'm all for calling out sodomy. You said something to me. <laughs> what it was it? Do you remember what you said? I showed that to my wife. You said something to me as like, hey, these people are saying this or something. And I was like, aren't those the same people that promote sodomy? And you're like, yeah, probably. And I was like, yeah, I don't care what they say. <laughs> I don't care what they say. It was some government agency or something like that. LOL, JK. DOA. No. Uh, so, so stuff and things. Weather. Did you want to talk about the Great and Abominable Church? I think we should. There's some really powerful scriptures in um, Second Nephi. I want to say four, 13 and 14. Those two chapters that are just really, really powerful. And it basically one of the big things that people will get into is like. Especially, depending on who you're talking to, everybody has their own issues, right? But a lot of the Christians Not me. that don't, <laughs> a lot of the Christians that don't accept our faith as Christian, a lot of it has to do with the acceptance of the Book of Mormon. And we claim that it is alongside a companion to the Bible, a scripture. And that's a bold statement. Um, especially in the Bible where it says, like, there are two places, one in Deuteronomy, one in Revelations, if I remember right. Where it says, if you add from the, if you add to these books, um, basically you're evil. I don't remember the exact quotes, but um, the interesting thing is like the books were not written chronologically, and also that those books were compiled. And it's like there's 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 it's it's very easy to do Bible lawyering. Have you heard of that term? Did I say it? It's very easy to read, oh, this scripture says here, like there, there's, there's scriptures in Deuteronomy where it says how you test the prophet. And it's like basically if you ever have a prophet who says something and then that comes to be not true, they're not a prophet, which makes sense. Like that's a perfect, that makes sense. But then again, you also had Christ who taught in the New Testament. How do you know um, between a sheep's and wolf's clothing and a, or how do you know if a doctrine is his doctrine? And he said, well, you live it. And if, and when you live it, you'll find out. And it's like, oh, that's interesting, you know, it's, that's the, it's kind of an encouragement to, to be experimental in our, in our following of Christ, you know, but there's, there's, there's always, there's so many things that when you try and be, when you try and use your own reasoning to make excuses for your opinions, at what point do you, are you confident in your own reasoning, you know, at what point do you think that you know good enough to make that decision? Because it's like, for instance, one of the things that um, people get hung up on is there's parts in the scriptures where it says that, um, I'm trying to remember, I think this is in Deuteronomy as well, but it says like Christ, it says like Christ is the, um, from eternity to eternity, and he's always been and he always will be. Um, and they, they take that and they say, how can Christ be the son of God? if um like he's been from eternity to eternity type of a thing and it's like oh that's i can understand what you're saying but then you think of also like well what is eternity eternity is a function of time and it's like well christ is our christ in in time and time is what we have right now in front of us but i don't think god is bound by time and so once we get outside if, if you were to take a, take it and get outside of time and then how do you how do you describe things accurately to someone who only lives in time? You know you can't because it's there's references that we don't understand, and it's like that's one of the reasons why religion gets so there's so many different opinions on things is because it's not an easy topic to understand, and Satan uses that he takes scriptures and he he mingles in truth so that he can obfuscate what the actual intent is, and that's that's Christ's church and and. Or I mean, the the whore of the earth, the Church of Satan, um, has always been for the purpose of giving enough truth to 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 resonate with the part of us that that seeks truth, while while hiding us from God. Science. Science. 
I love science. Get those people. Oh, man. There's so many funny people. And I truly do love science. But it's like people have turned science into a religion. Mm -hmm. No. You know, we talk about the, the great and abominable church of the earth. And the guy in the video made a way better argument for it than I can or than I can remember to make. But uh, he basically says that the great and abominable church will be government. And that makes sense. Um, control um, and you know, whatnot, and then the Church of Christ won't necessarily be just just our church. I think it'll be all Christians, and not just Christians, but all, all liberty, people searching all for liberty, God, yeah. liberty loving people. It will be just another chapter of the war in heaven, choosing between freedom and and control. And so we, I mean, we have to be very careful of the trust that we put in not just government, but in all men. Be careful of hero worship. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle that you're on. We saw it with Obama. No, we saw, saw it with, with Bush. Trump. See it with Trump. We'll see it with this administration too. If you think Trump's going to be our savior, you're the savior will be our savior. Yeah, exactly. You're in for a rude awakening. I mean, Trump had Trump. If you look at the the, the damage Trump has done with Big Pharma, empowering Big Pharma to have control, like over so much so many aspects of our of our lives in that sense like Trump's Trump's done some really really bad things for the American people he's done some very bad things for the American people and people are like oh this is you know 4D chess and he's got this and this and like you know I don't know maybe there's some truth to some of the things maybe he has good intents on some of the things I, I, I've liked him for the most part and I, I voted for him twice you know we didn't we don't we I know that you always I think that that disappointed you no but I I've, I've liked him but this year we've been we've we've been very disappointed I've been very disappointed with not only him but also the I'm very disappointed our, with the our governor just Republicans and Republicans in general no I wasn't disappointed that you voted for Trump I wasn't disappointed that anybody voted for Trump. The only thing that I said was, you know, look at all the options, and once you find something that you agree with completely, and whoever you agree with the most, whoever you think is the best candidate, that's who you should cast your vote for. Yeah. I found somebody else that I thought was a better candidate, and so that's who I voted for. I voted for what best rep represented my views and my beliefs and what I've been taught. So therefore, I felt it was my responsibility to vote for a different candidate, whether or not he can he had a chance to win. Yeah. It was not Joe Biden. Oh, Joe Biden. Douchebag. I voted for Don Blankenship. He was the Constitution Party candidate. And there wasn't a way that he could win. He wasn't on the ballot in enough states to get 270 electoral votes, but I read his platform and his policies. And those were my beliefs and what I believe that God intends for man. So that's what I voted for. Because I believe that once once you know better, you, what choice do you really have? Doing the right thing isn't always going to mean that you win. Mm-hmm. But it's doing the right thing. It's not always meant to be easy. But the more times you choose to do right, the easier it becomes to 
make those choices regardless of how hard they are. And I sat on it and I thought, I thought about it for a few days after everything else on my ballot was filled out. And I just knew that I had to vote for the other Don. Hmm. He had a sweet mustache too. <laughs> but I mean, you have to vote with your conscience. If your conscience tells you that Donald Trump's the best candidate, great. If your conscience tells you that Joe Biden is the best candidate, great. Just re do your research. Don't just blindly, you know, cast that vote because of a color or a letter that's by their name. Do what's right, not just what's right for you and what benefits you, what's best for your posterity. And to me, that's neither one of the two main parties. Everything that can save our society is right here. And right here. That's what's going to save us. And not not to not to the the bastardized meanings that we use now but by the original intent what are you looking for well I was going to look at the um, the abom great and abominable church but do you mind if I look around for a little bit no I don't know what I'll talk about to keep them busy and occupied while they're doing it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was too it was too difficult to keep talking politely. Whoa. I don't mind talking to you and chewing on sunflower seeds, but beautiful. So, some of the things that Nephi said, um, this is Nephi, 2 Nephi 33, 11, I read 12 too, or I mean 10 too, it says, And now my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words, and believe in Christ. And if ye believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words. For they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words. At the last day, and you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. This is the, some of the last words that Nephi wrote. He's basically saying, believe, believe in Christ and you'll believe in these words, or believe in these words, and they will bring, bring you to Christ. It's like, because these are Christ's words. And then he's like, and you and I will stand face to face before Christ, before that judgment bar, and you'll know that this is what I was commanded of me. And it's just like, we need to live our lives in a way. Oh, just blow it over here. Yeah. We need to live our lives in a way that we can stand before the judgment bar of God, and it doesn't matter who we stand against or who we stand with. We'll know that we'll be able to, to have evidence that we followed what we, the light which we were given. 
we followed the the good that which which we received whether that's regardless of what religion you take part in regardless of what um regardless of who you are follow the good that's in your life and it'll lead you to eventually it'll lead you to christ and that's it's it's such a beautiful thing and and if it doesn't lead you to christ in this life I, that's fine follow the good that you have in your life and eventually you'll be where whether whether what no matter what you believe you'll eventually you'll receive the the reward of that goodness that's what life is all about it's about learning to become something better and enjoying enjoying better nature itself you talk about like the conservation of energy you talk about like um, how nature energy is always moving from a higher state to a lower state so it's moving from a way that is um, more complex to less complex it atrophies you talk about um, all these sorts of things one of the things that makes us inherently human is our ability to take something that's that's atrophied and gone to a weakening state and build and create and make it better bring it to a more advanced state that's what we do that's what we do with refining of, of oil that's what we do with um, building homes and and any kind of like anything that you do you're taking something that's more in chaos and bringing structure and beauty and life into it anything that has value and that's that happens to you on a spiritual level throughout your life and that's 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 why we share these things and we we're we don't shy away from the fact that they're related to God because freedom is related to God God's the author of it he gave us our free agency he gave it to us and then and then he let us fight for it it's up to it's up to us to to carry that cross it's up to us to to bear that mantle and continue to fight for it so that our children can fight for it so our children can have it and that they don't have to 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 endure slavery and servitude and regardless of what country you're in because there are some bad places in the world there are some people that are living under hard circumstances but there is freedoms that you can enjoy that are God-given that's your ability to think for yourself the ability to choose what you do and what you say nobody can force you nobody can make your mouth say words you don't allow them to say if you consent then you give up that freedom when you consent to the little things you you no longer have the freedom to say the things that you want to say to to think the things that you want to think and it's it's that's what this battle is about it's all about control it's all about controlling what you can and can't do by your own volition be free that's that's what we encourage and that's what we want people to do beautiful beautiful yo we talk a lot in the church about this being Christ's true church um and yeah, I believe that's true. You believe that's true. You know, that's kind of the theme. This is Christ's church, the most correct church on earth. With that, do you mind if I interrupt real quick? After I make my point. <laughs> the point being that more importantly than your religious affiliation, is your belief in Christ. It's got to start somewhere. Just like anything else, it has to start somewhere. If it leads you to this church, great. But if it just, if, you know, believing in Christ is the biggest thing. Believing in Christ is believing in freedom. So whether you believe in our church or not, you know, that's not a big deal to me. You're, it's your belief and your willingness and your desire to help advance the cause of freedom and believing in Christ and, and making this world better and more free, not just for us, but for those under, under the rule of the oppressed for our posterity. 
that's more important at this point. The thing I was going to point out is, like you said, we do believe that this church is true. The, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we believe, was restored by God through prophets and through revelation and through priesthood. There are, there are Christ himself and God showed themselves to Joseph Smith. We believe that and we testify of that. We believe that that is true. That being said, not everybody who goes to church is a good person. Not everybody who is in the church has good intent. Gasp. We're not, we're not deceived by that. The, the fact that this church was established by God and by Christ, and then he invited people into it. And people screw everything up. They like always seek to more power yeah, and more authority. We are, we, one of the main fallibilities of this life is we are corruptible. And this church and is... easily so. Yeah, this church is a true church. And and I and I will testify that. I went, I went on a two-year mission because I believe that. And I still believe that. And it would be a betrayal of the, of, the, of the responses from God that I have personally received to deny that. However, like Mitch said, we, bring, we, we, we want people to get closer to Christ. Regardless of what the mechanism, mechanism is for you becoming closer to Christ, just follow Him. Whether that's in the church, whether it's out of the church, I don't know. And that's not my, I'm not going to tell everybody what to do. It's not my place, and that's not right, even, if I were to try. It would be wrong for me to try. To try. However, I encourage people to try. Do, do what you need to do to, to live freely, to live under, under the love of Christ and your love of your fellow man. Christ brought something to the world that no other major religion or organization or, or dogma had ever taught was the value of the individual, the value of the person. You look at things like rape. Rape was always considered a, like in, in the ancient laws of Israel and Jew, in the Jewish um, heritage, rape was a, a property crime. It was like when someone killed your cow. It was a property crime against the man of the household. You, you look at things that like, there, Christ brought the value of the individual to the world. That's just one of the things that he did. He was our savior and he, he died for us, but he also, he brought these freedoms, these concepts that you look at, when you look at the history of like the English common law and you look at the history of the Magna Carta, and you look at the history of our constitution, the only reason those things flourished is due to Christianity, is due to the, the people being Christian. And yeah, it's, that's, that may be contradictory, or not contradictory, that may be contentious for some people to think about, but you know what? The truth take the, the evil people take the truth to be a hard thing. Are you, what unites us in this should be Christ, the Constitution, and individual liberty. That should be our uniting factors. So regardless of what denomination you are, who you belong to, what what faith you claim, I think, at this point, is less important than those uniting factors that we have. We know that when Christ, when Christ comes, and when there's the cleansings, and and everything, it's not just going to be Mormons <laughs> that survive. No, that are a chosen people. No. I think when it comes to what we were talking about, the great and abominable church, those being those who worship and subscribe to government and the church of christ being those who believe in christ but also in liberty and in, in individual liberty and that's at at this point i believe is far more important this is all this rising number 15 probably episode 15 man 
I just hiccuped. I feel like I need to say amen. Like, it's been, <laughs> it's been good. Well, hopefully, hopefully, if if you do find these valuable, if you do enjoy listening, if you are one of the few that finds this somewhat entertaining, um, we or encourage something. you. We encourage you to to share it with others, or at the very least, find things that not even just us, but find things that get you the information that you're seeking without going through the media, without going through CNN or Fox or MSNBC or, you know... Newsmax. Those, what? Newsmax. Newsmax or Sky News or whatever it is. There's B, the BBC, you know. There is, there is so many things that are available to you if you just open your eyes and look. You can look on YouTube, you can look on Facebook, you can look on all these different places... And, and there's always agendas. I mean, don't just trust something because it's not one of the mainstream medias. <laughs> but oh, man. Oh, man. Also, also be be aware that you you are not pigeonholed into only having your cable news. Seek the inspiration and revelation from the Lord. Ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. But you have to do your part as well. Yeah. That's episode 15, I think. Love liberty. Yeah. Booyah, Mike, Mike throw. Don't embarrass yourself. I haven't stopped it yet. Oh.